Now I'm excited to introduce our next session. Um, this will be a fireside chat titled Building Enterprise LLM Applications in Banking. And joining us for this talk will be the head of the AI Hub, as well as head of engineering for digital assets, treasury, clearance, and collateral at BNY Mellon, Sarthak Padanayak, and CEO and co-founder at Snorkel AI, Alex Ratner. And our fun fact uh, for Sarthak, he is online 23-7. <laughs> so as we head into this, please post your questions in the Q&A and don't forget to up upvote your favorite one. I'll hand it over to you, Alex and Sarthak. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for the intro, and and most importantly, Sarthik, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. That was, I think, that's I'll defend that that's a fun fact. It's a it's an incredibly thrilling time to be an AI. Also, good good management testament. If we got that from someone on your team, if they believe you're online 23 hours, I gotta I'm gonna ask you for some uh, some some uh, uh, some tips and tricks later after the the chat. But on a serious note, um, welcome and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat about you know. AI meets real world impact with us today based on uh, your incredible purview at BNY. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Alex, for having me. Uh, and it's an exciting opportunity. And I'm just uh, very excited about what you and Snorkel and the entire uh, st uh, you know, team is uh, up to. Uh, so just for introductions, I'm Sarthak Patnaik. And uh, I work in Bank of New York Mellon. Uh, as some of you might know, Bank of New York Mellon is one of the eight global systemically important financial institutions in the United States and uh, is pretty much is the largest custodian, the largest collateral manager, the largest secret lending agent. And I support uh, the artificial intelligence uh, teams here as well as lead engineering for a few lines of businesses. Very excited about this discussion. and. Uh, Looking forward to it. Well, awesome. I mean, I think I, I want to just highlight for the audience here. We have a, uh, just shy of I think five hundred people active and some more joining. This should be. Uh, please, please, uh, you know, drop stuff into the Q and A um, so we can answer either if we have uh, time at the end. Um, so I think I'll leave that to you, um, uh, or or uh, in the Q and A session dedicated afterwards. So I think for those of you who who don't uh, you know understand the intricacies of of banking, first of all, one of the really exciting things here is that. I mean, at a super high level, right? There are, you know, kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, chatbots that are meant for fun consumer applications. And if they make a, an occasional hallucination or mistake, it doesn't really matter. And then there's the average use case that uh, Sarthik and his team deal with that is, uh, let's just say, not uh, quite, uh, it's a little bit more difficult than that performance spec. The data is more complex and uh, domain specific and average. The performance bar to actually be put anywhere near production, given the role that BNY plays, uh, uh, not just as a bank, but as a custodian bank, um, a lot higher. And so I'm excited to dive into kind of what that specifically means for how you translate recent uh, advances. But let's take a step back first. I mean, you mentioned um, how old BNY Mellon is. I think, am I correct? It just turned uh, 240 years old, which is uh, slightly older than 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 uh, Snorkel and uh, and slightly older than most uh, most organizations on the planet. So, you know, you've obviously moved pretty quickly with AI and um, before getting into the how, we'd love to ask you a little bit of the why. You know, why is AI important for um, you know a bank where you might argue um, you know moving slowly could be the, the 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 strategy? Why is it important to move quickly and move uh, with AI? Yeah, uh, and Alex, if you think about uh, the entire set of investable assets in the world, investable assets, it's in the order of two hundred thirty to two hundred forty trillion dollars, and BNY Mellon is responsible for custody or safekeeping $47 trillion of those, 20% of world's investable assets. And when you think about that, what that means is when people buy or sell assets, when you buy or sell your money in a 401k or you buy an IBM share or you um, sell a Tesla share, those movements actually the execution happens somewhere else, but actual movements of shares happens on our platform. And 20% of that happens on our platform. On a typical day, we move around $20 trillion of those securities, which is almost equivalent to the GDP of the United States is what we do every day. Hence, we are at that central place of movement of data, movement of high quality structured data. These are not like senior apps. These are actual transactions, actual dollar values, actual provider, actual receiver, and so forth. 
And when you are privy to $20 trillion of that across all of our various systems, the question is, how do we leverage this data to do three things? One, how can we better be better for our clients? How do you leverage AI to solve their problems better? Second, how can we run our businesses better, more streamlined, more scalable, more efficient? And third, how do we power our culture? How do we invest in our people? How do we grow talent so that we can build solutions for both our clients as well as for ourselves? And AI is a pretty transformational um, uh, technology. And the fact that we have this technology, we have access to this data and our talent, we feel that we are um, at an intersection of something uh, really uh, transformative uh, that's you know ahead of us here. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the difficulty of adapting to that massive and unique of an operating uh, setting, but also the potential impact of even you know tenth of tenths of a percent of uh, you know of delta on some kind of um, you know a, you know some kind of process in terms of efficiency, sometimes of some type of decision in terms of accuracy. I mean, it's 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 staggering, and so pretty exciting uh, place to be playing in. So before getting into some of the, you know, I'd love to ask you in a bit about kind of some of where you're applying AI or, or planning to apply AI and the potential impact and some of the tools and techniques that um, in your very unique and, and kind of very, let's just say real production setting, not really demo land, um, what you're seeing uh, live up to the hype, what, what doesn't. Just to start with, you know, it, it, you mentioned the word platform already from a banking perspective, but you know, with AI, a lot of it is how do you build the platform uh, or the structure? And then, and then how do you, how do you get the people around the table and, and not just the, the data scientists or the AI engineers, but often the, uh, the subject matter experts who understand that that very unique data. Um, how have you thought about at an organizational level, kind of putting that platform and people part of the equation together before we get into, you know, into the methods that I'm sure many here will be interested in? Sure. I mean, Alex, if you think about it, uh, when we think about AI, it's not just the builders of AI capabilities is what we are reflecting on. It's the builders are just the, the smallest part of it. And then there are engineers across the organization who build applications for clearance and settlements and payments and collateral and liquidity. And we want all of them to build AI for systems, systems that are not deterministic, systems that learn day over day. So they need to go through that engagement model. And beyond that, our people, our operations people, our relationship management, our sales, our legal, how do they leverage AI? So it is an organizational level transformation. And when we thought about going through an organizational level transformation, we said, let's take, let's take a leaf out of uh, uh, big tech or technology companies on the West Coast. I'm sure that there's a lot of members here. And how can we think about this as a platform? And when we think about a platform, there are some core capabilities that a platform engineering and technology capabilities that it has. But then how do we, reduce that incidental complexity for everybody else in the organization to build AI solutions. I'm, I'm sure there is intrinsic complexity of the particular model, but the incidental complexity of connecting to data, connecting to infrastructure, having common tools, model validation. How do we you know, talk to our clients? How do we you know, solve all of that holistically? And so that's where we started build the build out of our uh, Plat AI platform for the whole bank. We call it Eliza. And uh, that's something that has uh, gone live over, over in, in the last couple of months. And one of the things that we are very focused on right now is risk aspect of it. Because at the end of it, we are safekeeping 20% of world's assets. And how do we bring responsible AI practices from the outset is our biggest opportunity because once we on the trust, that's when we can start to, to you know go at scale um, in terms of building solutions. So that's how we're thinking about it: a platform model which focuses on the core engineering platform, data, infrastructure, talent, responsible AI practices, as well as an entire strategy to execute on it. That's an awesome overview. Yeah, and I like, I mean, the mention of the. The, the kind of um, proportions of the kind of core AI and, and data science uh, persona that you, you know, 
probably very well represented in this audience today. And that, that uh, you know, you, you and I spend a lot of time with, obviously, but in the bigger picture of how AI is actually going to make it a real line of business impact in applications, pretty small percentage. It kind of reminds me, it's like the people equivalent of there's a, a Google paper, um, something like, like ML systems, the high interest credit card of technical debt or something. It's a, it's a famous Google paper, but they, you know, there's all the, the a picture and they have all these uh, boxes and the smallest box is the machine learning algorithm. And all the other boxes are the, you know, the, the data system, the, you know, all the serve, everything else is the, the machine around it. Kind of the same as like you were saying a similar thing with respect to people, right? You have the, the AI data science people at the center of the hub, but then you have all the, the subject matter experts or line of business users. You have the application developers. Um, uh, so it's, it, that's a, it's a, it's a, a cool thing. And, um, I think, um, you know, organizations across the world have been building up kind of application developer, you know, um, numbers for years. And then arguably what the LLM wave has done is it's kind of opened the floodgates for a really simple API for models for those application developers. Um, but now, uh, you know, arguably you have a similar sized AI team that has to serve this just, you know, profusion of interest from all those app developers, line of business, et cetera. And so, I mean, maybe that segues into another piece. Like, how do you think about, um, how do you think about talent? Because a lot of teams in industry are just struggling to keep up with demand. You know, the, 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 um, the chat GPT moment happened. There's interest flooding in from, you know, the, the, the spokes around the hub, the line of businesses at every organization. A lot of what I hear from data science leaders is we're not only struggling to fulfill demand, we're struggling to just educate about what is possible, when, how, you know, what's the right way to do it, uh, et cetera. So before we get into all that, like, how do you think about talent? Um, uh, because it's the top of mind thing for many of us. Sure. And Alex, uh, if you think about us, when we build systems across our enterprise, which settle $20 trillion every day with a peak velocity of $22 billion a second, we have extremely strong engineers who can build all of these capabilities, right? At massive parallel scale, at massive uh, uh, performance with a high level of resilience and so forth. So we have optimized, we have engineers who optimize that every microsecond of a particular transaction. Now, the question then is, so they, those engineers were trying to solve a very different type of problem, but they had it within them. So now the question is, how do we align them in terms of optimizing something else? At the end of it, everything is a goal function or a loss function, and you're trying to optimize uh, that. So we have some of those distinguished engineers that within our organization that we leverage. Second is the subject matter expertise. You mentioned we have been, we are the first bank in the United States. We have been here for 240 years, and we were there when the um, when the checks were processing, we were there when uh, the wires were getting processed and now the real-time payment. So we know what our clients need and the subject matter and sometimes the history actually helps you understand, discern what was different and so forth. So those are two of our assets plus the fact that we have access to the clients. But then we also know that we do not need talent to build the core infrastructure. Like we are going to depend upon the big techs to provide some of those capabilities. We're going to depend upon specialist companies like yourself who are solving a very niche problem, but a very important problem. Because while everybody's focusing on the large language models, the problem is not the large language models. The large language models will be in the realm of, you know, there will be some solutions and there'll be some open sources and so forth. It's how do you develop your data now, Alex, I'm perhaps picking up a couple of lines from, uh, <laughs> I, I, perhaps I've been talking a lot to you, but how do you develop the data, right? Because how do you fall in love with your data? I think, because we say data is our biggest asset, but then how do you fall in love with it? How do you store it, index it, tokenize it, vectorize it, and create distances? And I, I think the opportunity set of that is just amazing. And how do we depend upon talent who upgrade themselves to take advantage of that. That is our biggest thing. Beyond that, we are absolutely looking to hire some great, uh, you know, specifically masters and PhD students who can continue on understanding the domain, work with our teams, and really uh, work on hyperparameter tuning or you know different ways in which we can position our data to get the best value out of a large language model or just 
solve practical problems. So very excited about that. So that's how we're looking at talent. The last thing I will say is we are taking a long-term approach to it. And we have some great partnerships with some very eminent schools in United States and in India. And that falls our in a, the organic pipeline in which we get masters and PhD students uh, uh, as a part of that who want to solve some real problems, right? real client problems, uh, which are bounded and it's noticeable. That's an awesome answer. There's a ton of stuff to unpack. I mean, I, I just want to dwell on a couple of things there. First of all, um, I love the, uh, you know, data development, fall in love with your data. Um, I think, you know, we have some members in the marketing team. This is, this is my, my, my gambit, by the way, you know, get, uh, get someone, uh, you know, much smarter than me to come on and, you know, give them a little bit of our thinking and then have them say it better. And then we'll, we'll steal those lines. I'm kidding. We'll, we'll ask you for permission first, but it's a great, a great summary of the, uh, the, the snorkel, you know, snorkel thesis. Um, you know, but I, I think just moving on from just that, um, well, first of all, the, the point about subject matter experts, I just want to dwell on, on that for a second. Uh, those people who know about the data and know about the expertise and know how to know how to do that data development. What what is a what is a good response to a customer according to you know our organization standards? What is the right label for this piece of data or this transaction given all of the institutional model? What is the you know the right um, response to this question about this multi hundred page legal document? Again, these are not questions that and well, first of all, these are not questions that a large language model, no matter how powerful, trained on public internet data, magically knows. Just like a human who goes, like, I like the example, uh, you know, you could send a, someone to college for 10 more years. Um, they're not going to suddenly learn how to become an expert, you know, legal analyst or underwriter, right? It's just not the subject material. So no matter how big we train these models, they don't know that domain expertise um, until you specialize them. So how do you get those subject matter experts? You know who who have that specialist knowledge to inject that, and when we talk about data, by the way, here kicked off this um this summit of talking about you know, the importance of data development and your enterprise's data. That doesn't that doesn't just mean like the data lake. That means the data that's in your subject matter experts' heads. So I mean, I wonder if you have a couple of thoughts on on how you've had um, uh, you know, successes or 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 challenges with getting the subject matter experts involved in the AI dev process. Yeah. I mean, if you think about what Wall Street is, is significant amount of value moving. And the reason it's moving is because there are different intermediaries who are taking different parts of the risk and playing different roles in the entire ecosystem. Some of them are taking market risk, some of them are taking counterparty risk, some of them are taking operational risk and so forth. Right. So it's about risk management. And when there are multiple intermediaries, information flows through various systems, various pipes. In a lot of cases, it's serial. And what happens when information flows? It's data quality becomes a problem. Reconciliation becomes a problem. Ability to understand the fidelity of information becomes a problem and so forth. And so the opportunity set that we see is how can we provide the best possible data to our large language models to really you know come up with insights as compared to just what is available right because and just hoping for success and that is one of the key things uh, for us from a data development perspective which is super important and traditionally wall street has been very focused on structured data tick level data stock price moving over yep. to, uh, as well as structured data but the opportunity set now is the access to unstructured data. Yeah. Can I look at liquid cash balances from a 10Q report of every earnings? What was the mood in the earnings statement? What, how is the Fed talking about it? So these are some of these opportunity sets now that we can look into from a multimodal perspective uh, across all of them and how do we connect all of those dots across public data sets, internal structured data, internal unstructured data and come up with a more coherent view of what the world looks like and what are our opportunities and where, where are those arbitrage opportunities and so forth. It's an awesome, awesome pr perspective and segue into what I was going to ask about next. But um, yeah, just to know, I've heard the phrase used kind of the iceberg under the surface. That's the you know, unstructured data and structured data. We have so much built up, so much still to do. 
but arguably the biggest impact of these large language or foundation models is unstructured data, right? If there's a variety of, I mean, that's where they kind of, you know, that's, that's what, that's where they, uh, you know, kind of started to make impact their, their applications of structured data, but there, there are reasons to believe the, the impact will just, you know, in, intrinsically be bigger and unstructured, uh, uh, not just because we did that first. So that's kind of the frontier and it's the frontier for getting at that, that, you know, unique information that lets you make better decisions in that multi-party system. Um, now moving to data, as you said, um, and you know, we, we like data here. Uh, we, we love data. Sorry. That's the, that's the phrase, right? Um, how, how have you seen kind of the, the types of data development, the types of AI development evolve even over this last year? I mean, one, one phrase that I've used often and kicked off that I think there was like the first slide um, uh, that I used for the, the uh, kickoff here was, you know, the, the classic picture of a Gartner hype cycle. And, you know, if you look back at the, the latest cycle, right, you know, it started with a lot of, you know, these are magic, maybe, maybe humans are going to be replaced and, uh, and, and no, you know, no one is needed. Then it was, you know, uh, at least from our perspective, it was very heavily about prompting. You know, maybe we don't need data science. Maybe it's mostly just prompting. And then we've kind of gotten into predictably the more nuanced, you know, sets of methods. I'm curious, kind of how you've. I mean, you don't. You may not even agree with that recounting of things. Um, but but how have you seen the kind of hype cycle traversal, uh, in terms of you know the the actual the ways you're developing your data, the tools for the job. Yeah, I mean, number one, financial data this industry has evolved over a period of time, right? And when you get a 80 page contract or 200 page contract, every word means something. And it has material impact. I'm, I'm curious to look at a vectorized version of every paragraph because every paragraph perhaps means something and there will be different perhaps dimensions that show up in every paragraph because there's a reason why they have been uh, pushing as such. They're complex, they're dense, and it's very commercial. Right, so that's uh, the nature of a financial unstructured data, and the opportunity set that we have. If you think, go back to the history, financial industry. You started with twenty, twenty-five years ago, databases. A database, write a query, get something, and then we said, no, there are some standard reporting that I need to have. So let's do some warehouses, some business intelligence tools, slice and dice. So you standardize, spend hundreds of millions of dollars to standardize the data, and then you go. And then you said, no, 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 no. Why do I need to standardize? Let me put, keep it, the data in the source at the lake. And then now we are at the mesh. But the mesh still right now is very focused on the structured data. And our opportunity set that we are thinking about is how do we link that to the unstructured data? Unstructured data with critical data elements that can be pre-canned out and then connected to the masters. And then there are other data elements, which we know is out there, which can be more aggregatable proactively or something that will be for ad hoc questions. So the goal here is to build that data ecosystem around this. Now, the key challenge that we need to solve, and I think that's a very difficult problem to solve, is around data access. As we start mulching information, how do we ensure that the right access is maintained? How do we ensure that there is not a lot of privacy issues, data security issues and so forth? But again, this is where we are taking a step-by-step -step approach. There is one front around developing data that Alex, we talked about. There is one thing around data access that we have to focus on more from a responsive layer because we feel that if we solve these two things at a ground level, we can wait for some of those LLM battles to uh, the, the bake-offs to happen and uh, we'll be positioned. But nobody will solve that problem for us uh, in that front. So that's where we are more excited about. Yeah, I think that's such an awesome statement. I guess I'm, I'm uh, Rebecca is very friendly, but she's the hook for us, I think, to, to get off stage, I'm guessing. So uh, just to wrap up, I just want to just double click on that that last statement that you made. Sorry, I think obviously I think that is that, you know, the intersection of what what you care about and have an amazing, I mean, just amazingly unique and amazingly scaled perspective out of really anyone in the in the 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 AI space today, and obviously where where we spend a lot of time on the method side, is that importance of everything around the data, the access, the the responsibility and governance, the development for tuning or training specific models. As you said, the LLM stuff, you know, the models are getting you know quite standardized and and they're evolving and they'll continue to evolve in generic ways but that'll kind of take care of itself the you know the infrastructure the algorithms again it's a wonderful state to be in the ai ml world because a lot of standardization 
crazy. I, if you asked me a decade ago, do you think every single vertical would be using the same algorithm, the same machine learning model architecture? I'd say that was crazy, but that's the state that we're in. So if you think about it, you know, if you're, you know, in kind of position like like yours and like many in this this audience, okay, those are kind of you know probably going to get to some usable state. What's the part that no one else is going to solve for you? It's the data and all the expertise and everything that gets baked into how to use it, uh, access it, develop it. So I love that. I love the phrase, you know, uh, I, you know, fall in love with your data. I uh, also love the idea of, you know, it's all about optimization. And we have to kind of teach people that it's not just about optimizing the systems and the algorithms, it's also about optimizing the data. You know, that's that's in some ways the center of gravity these days. But um, um, I'll, I'll give you, if you have any last words for the audience about the, uh, the opportunity ahead, um, uh, as you see it, I'll, I'll let you have the last word. But I'll just say thank you so much for sharing some of your perspectives. I could ask you a million more questions, but we'll we'll follow up uh, for folks in the audience in the Q and A session. Um, and uh, Sarthik, thank you for for joining today. Yeah, no, thank you, Alex and Rebecca. I just want to thank everybody on this. Uh, Bank of New York Mellon. Uh, we are at a really think AI is transformational. We really think we can make the markets more efficient, more safe more resilient, more secure. That's our job as a custodian. And we are looking for some amazing engineers, both masters and PhDs, people who really want to solve problems uh, and uh, looking forward to getting a chance to work with uh, yourselves as well as some of the other members on the call. So thank you so much, Alex. And uh, uh, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, sir. See well, you if there's all. anyone here looking, I highly recommend. I mean, this is the literally... And but then I promise Rebecca is the last thing else to say. But I, I literally say this to you know students at you know UW or Stanford or wherever that are graduating. Like think about not just going to a Google where you're only going to learn about you know a very limited to use cases. Go to where the real action is at, where AI is actually translating to value. And and uh, um, sometimes that could be snorkel. You never know. But uh, but I think BNY uh, is doing amazing things. And Sarthik, um, thank you so much for sharing just a, a small uh, bit of that today. Um, Thank really you, Alex. It. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much.